Hello, viewers. Uh, welcome back to the uh, dialogue series of Jindal School of International Affairs. I am Professor Sriram Chaulu. I'm the Dean of the School of International Affairs at Jindal University in India. And uh, this is a space where periodically we have intelligent conversations with um, highly uh, knowledgeable experts on a variety of topics that are of relevance to the contemporary world. And um, in the situation of the coronavirus pandemic and the uh, lockdown and the stay at home orders, uh, we have launched this to be able to reach out to um, audiences that are interested in understanding uh, from scholarly and uh, uh, other sources, what is exactly going on, why it's happening, and uh, how can we prepare for this, you know, extraordinarily shocking uh, uh, period where there's been a complete rupture and a break with uh, the business as usual. So we are living in extraordinary times. And uh, of all the regions in the world that have been severely impacted by the pandemic, the one that comes most to everyone's mind is Europe. Today, uh, I am very, very privileged to have with me uh, a very senior um, intellectual and thinker, uh, Professor Sonia Lucarelli. She uh, teaches at the University of Bologna, uh, the world's oldest university in the world in Italy. And uh, she's a Europeanist. Uh, she has uh, taught and written um, uh, extensively on the questions uh, which are of high relevance to contemporary Europe, uh, the, its major problems and the solutions. So uh, just to give you a, an example, uh, in recent years, she has been leading major uh, projects on the EU's uh, problems related to migration, which as you know, has been uh, you know, very pressing uh, problem going back at least uh, to 2015 uh, or even before. Uh, she's also uh, a scholar on European foreign policy, the EU identity and the EU institutions and um, has been really an outstanding voice. So thank you, Sonia. Thank you for uh, joining me today in this amazing uh, you know, platform that we've created. It's a privilege to have you. Thank you very much. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Sonia, as we said, um, the number one issue that has dominated um, conversation about Europe in the last four or five months has been this great tragedy and uh, the loss of lives in your own country, in Italy, in Spain, in France, in Britain. And uh, people often forget in smaller countries, if you do a per capita analysis of the deaths from coronavirus, uh, even smaller ones um, like the Netherlands, Sweden, um, uh, Aust and so on have also been affected. And uh, Belgium, they've suffered quite a lot. And uh, this, in a way, the, the, the pandemic has kind of ravaged some of these countries. Uh, perhaps Germany is the only big European country that uh, came out with the fewer fatalities, but overall it's been quite a devastating uh, loss. So uh, first of all, I'm so happy, Sonia, that you know you are fine and healthy because you know people have been very worried about Italy, and you know Italy is the world's favorite. Everybody loves Italy, but um, we have been watching sadly. Uh, the losses we, uh, of the last uh, four or five months. So, so first thing, Sonia, for the audience, you know, uh, the most important question on contemporary question on people's minds is, how come Europe was so unprepared, uh, except Germany maybe, and to some extent, I think the Eastern European countries survived okay, the Central and Eastern European countries like Hungary and Poland were okay, but otherwise, the biggest countries, including France. Italy, Spain, Britain, um, all of them seem to be, uh, uh, to have made major mistakes and could not really fathom the depth of this crisis that was coming. So, and I know there is probably an accounting going on right now, individually in each country, people are asking questions, what went wrong and where did our governments make a mistake? Where did the society uh, make a mistake? So this is actually a very grim uh, moment for Europe uh, as it is just picking up the pieces 
from the from the devastation so so sonia what do you think in your view can we generalize um for these affected countries and say you know these were the factors and where did they go wrong you know and what can they learn from this because people are saying there could be a second wave there could be a third wave of coronavirus uh to what extent do you think is europe uh, going to be able to manage this going forward where did it go wrong first so uh, so first of all thank you very much for having me here it's really a pleasure to be with you uh, and to see you and to have the opportunity to discuss these important issues with you um uh, first of all the first thing we should notice is that europe has not experienced uh, to the same uh, extent that uh, several asian countries have uh, significant epidemics i mean to uh, that have affected a large number of countries and a large number of people so uh, sars 1 for instance did not affect europe to the same extent and you could actually say so because we were completely unprepared hmm? so uh there have been uh, um some lessons learned from previous epidemics uh, uh, that have led to the european union for instance uh, after the last one the sars 1 to set a center for the prevention of this type uh, of epidemics but it's a very initial step Uh, Europe in this as a continent particularly the european institutions do not have competencies on health health uh, is a competence of the member states mm-hmm. and there are some uh, facilities to coordinate efforts um there are some uh, there is also a clause that requests the member states to support each other in these uh, situations but we have different uh, health systems not only within the european countries we also have uh, regionalized health in several countries it's the case of italy where the regions have uh, uh, important competencies in health uh, it's the case uh, in germany and, and even more because it's a federal country so uh, there are huge differences um, among europe and there is not one european coordination that's the first thing the second thing uh, i already said it's uh, the um lack of a, of a recent uh, uh, precedent uh, that affected us uh, so directly so for instance there was a shortage of basic things like masks we do not produce them anymore we did not need them so much in the past apart from uh, i mean people working in specific conditions and so we were really lucky in this thing that's the, fir- the first two things the third thing is that uh, we um uh has to say this applies to all countries in the world but i think particularly those that were not concerned with pandemic so much as we were uh we did not know uh the the virus and so in the beginning it was underestimated uh mm-hmm. and we did not actually know the way in which it was uh, spreading and now this virus as we all know now is very contagious so if you even fail for one day or two days or one week to stop the spread then it, it risks becoming very uh, diffuse and we have uh, in italy uh, everything or a lot of this has been explained by the role of single individuals uh, the super spreaders of the virus i mean people that had a lot of social contacts so one individual person with a very active social life being able to uh, spread the contagion uh, very very fast and in such a way that in the beginning also spread it into hospitals because we didn't know what it was so this uh, uh, created a very strange situation in the case of italy whereby the area of the country that has been the most affected is in fact uh, very strangely the one that is uh, also better off in terms of health uh, system uh, Uh, of uh, economic conditions uh, 
So it's, uh, we would expect that uh, we would have more difficulties in the area of the country that usually are less off in, in the health sector and that are also more economically in difficulty. This is not the case. It affected very large Lombardia. And Lombardy is uh, still now the area of the country that is the most affected and much more in difficulty. Now, the rest of Europe, so I, I can't say actually, uh, contrary to several of my um, uh, fellow citizens, uh, I can't say that there have been so huge responsibilities into the health reaction that Italy had. Hmm? Uh, given the circumstances and given the fact that it was the first European country to be affected. However, I think that uh, uh, the delay of a, of a few days uh, to create uh, closed borders uh, in some areas of the countries uh, affected the other areas of the country. And I think that in other European countries, uh, uh, particularly some other European countries, even beyond the European Union now, in particular Great Britain, severe mistakes have been made because the lessons from Italy were not learned quickly and uh, um, probably um, the delay has also costed several lives uh, in their own country and also in other countries in Europe. So it took a while and, and the situation spread. The fact that, it, uh, that Europe is so connected to the world, so uh, you mm -hmm. made the example of, of Belgium and Brussels is a hub of the globalized world. Uh, Lomb Lombardy is uh, very much connected, much more than other areas of the world. Now this uh, uh, virus spreads through contagious uh, uh, that are human contagious. So uh, taking a plane is a very good way of uh, spreading the contagious worldwide. Mm -hmm. So this means that being uh, within the net of globalization, uh, health is spreading the, the virus more. So the more the, the little places in the south of Italy that much more detached from global networks uh, were mm -hmm. less Post. So uh, some, uh, there were some structural conditions, uh, some uh, delays, uh, and uh, the fact that we did not have, we have not developed enough coordination in the health sector so far in Europe, uh, uh, have all contributed to this result. Mm -hmm. I also think that a lot needs also to be, still to be understood in terms of the virus itself because for yeah. us, it continues to be very difficult to understand why Lombardy is still uh, the area of the country to be more affected. Mm. No, that's a good summary, Sonia. Um, in fact, I'll take you up on the point about the coordination because you know that um, in the early months, we were reading um, that um, the Italy and Spain, um, these countries that were affected early there was a lot of resentment that the rest of the EU, you know, they had imposed um, export bans on um, medical equipment and uh, that everybody had retreated into their own sh shells instead of coming out and supporting the worst affected nations. And uh, there was this uh, period when, um, you know, the entire, the Schengen, the free movement area was also suddenly uh, halted, but in a way that did not necessarily benefit the Southern European countries that were the worst affected. So um, the coordination, uh, and you, you did mention that the EU institutions as a whole do not have a lot of experience or um, uh, capability in the field of uh, pandemic uh, fighting. So uh, presumably, I mean, given the EU system, they must be studying these deficiencies now and coming, uh, um, so I'll, I'll come to the economic uh, recovery in a bit, but just on the health part, probably they are now uh, thinking about ways of uh, doing this better if the next wave or another such thing comes. Uh, so um, could we say that, you know, the, the losses are tremendous in lives uh, and economy, but at least as a result of this 
the EU will now, the EU structures will be more responsive on, on health issues and will find a new mechanisms to counter this challenge going into the future? Um, uh, this is an opportunity. I mean, as every crisis, uh, this is an opportunity. And uh, in several uh, observers now are thinking that this is a, a sort of last chance for the European Union to enhance uh, um, itself, mm, to, uh, to strengthen itself, particularly in the areas in which it is weaker. And uh, there has been a letter of the three presidents uh, of the institutions of the European Union on May 9, which is the day of Europe this year, that have uh, called, uh, it's a long letter that has been published on newspapers, they have been called for a, a stronger Europe, uh, a more uh, solidaristic Europe, uh, but however also a Europe that needs uh, institutional reforms. So you, mm -hmm. uh, there are a series of things, we will come to this in a moment, uh, that the European Union can do and in fact is doing uh, to cope with the crisis itself. Uh, but some measures uh, are, would be um, not sufficient uh, to cope with the, what will come in the future and to construct something that is really capable of reacting to similar situations in the future. So yeah, it's not, you know, it's not yeah. only a question of investing more on health, which is part of the new package, but it's also a question of strengthening European institutions and having a more unity from a political, social and economic terms, uh, because uh, the current structure, institutional structure of the European Union is very uneven in sectors. So, so there, it's much more supranational or intergovernmental, depending on the sectors. Uh, the European Parliament has not a role in some areas, which is, uh, I mean, quite striking, uh, while it has in others. So it's, uh, I think it would be time to, uh, to rethink of a, of a deepening of integration, although I also think it's a very hard moment to undertake it. Yeah, it's a hard moment. And um, Sonia, you mentioned the word unity. Um, in fact, worldwide, as you know, people are looking at regional responses, you know, because right now we see that, you know, the big global, big multilateralism has collapsed. Uh, and there's been a lot of uh, hope vested in regional and small group, you know, multilateralism. And that maybe, you know, geographically coherent regions can come together and uh, find common solutions for public health. And of course, everybody looks up to the EU because it is the most advanced regional integration project compared to all other, you know, parts of the world. Uh, be it in Asia or, or North America or, or um, Africa or Latin America. So in that sense, you know, the leader of the integration, uh, if, if, if um, the EU itself is struggling to, uh, to get a handle over a, a runaway pandemic, then, uh, you know, it, 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 the, the question people are asking is, can regional cooperation succeed at all, you know? Um, uh, if, if the EU is not able to succeed, then nobody can succeed because you have already uh, at least two decades ahead of most of the other regions of the world in integration. So single market, you know, common currency, uh, Schengen, you know, all these uh, uh, mobility. So you, in, in that sense, um, I think really um, the EU and the European experiment uh, integration will be um, the one to look out for uh, in terms of long-term pandemic preparedness. So while um, the institutions fail this time, while individual countries fail this time, I think it, is, it still remains by far the, uh, the leader in the whole concept of regionalism. So we hope there'll be more of that. And coming to that, uh, Sonia, um, the recently um, the German chancellor and the French president have announced a mega 750 billion euro European recovery fund. Now this has been hailed by some uh, commentators and politicians as a Hamiltonian moment for Europe. Uh, you know, using Alexander Hamilton's example from the US, you know, for the first time, the debt burden of the states of the US was federalized um, way back, you know, more than 200 years ago. 
But um, now finally, um, people are saying um, what the EU and the Europeans could not uh, do during the 2008 um, economic crisis, the 2010, the debt crisis of one decade ago, finally they have done it now. And uh, they are now uh, taking on common debt. Uh, in those days, it was a taboo, right? I mean, um, even uh, Angela Merkel herself used to oppose it at that time. Uh, any kind of uh, uh, euro bonds or um, you know common debt that will bail out and give grants and loans to the worst affected countries. Um, the critics were calling it a transfer union, you know, from the richer northern countries to the uh, poorer southern countries. But now um, this depression that we are all facing, the world is facing a global depression as a result of the pandemic, uh, but Europe uh, equally so. Um, so, and in a way, they hadn't even recovered from the last uh, crisis of the uh, of 2010, 11, 12, uh, and already now they are into another one, uh, probably a bigger one in terms of economy and to revive uh, the lost jobs and the uh, consumption, the production, exports, all these things. So, this new recovery fund, Sonia, um, what do you think made this happen in the first place? I mean, is it just that necessity is the mother of invention? And this time, you know, complete collapse of the entire um, continent in terms of economy. So therefore, the Germans had to change this time. Why did Merkel change? Uh, is this the same Angela Merkel, the leader of the EU, the de facto leader of the EU, the same woman today as the one who was refusing to you know, be generous to Italy or Spain or Greece in the past, in the earlier crisis. But this time she's saying, nothing doing, we are going to basically bail them out. You know, come what may, we will, if, if needed, taxpayers will, you know, uh, will bear the brunt for it in the richer countries, but all the hard hit countries had to be bailed out. So how did this revolution happen? I mean, and uh, probably you're happy with this development because, you know, as a believer in European integration, it seems like it is a, a quite a bold step going forward. Yes, definitely. Uh, before coming directly to this, but let me remind that, as you were mentioning, this is uh, a crisis on built upon uh, uh, other crises that have not been completely overcome. And particularly the 2008 crisis and uh, that continued into, into several other forms of crisis themselves, all linked to the economic uh, realm uh, from 2008 uh, onwards, more or less in Europe. That has been a, a huge hit for the European Union. It has put uh, uh, particularly the Eurozone under uh, great pressure. It has led to some um, um, revisions, reforms inside, uh, um, but everybody in Europe uh, uh, continues to remember this low path of response of the European Union, uh, the lack of solidarity in the beginning with respect to Greece. Uh, and now when we talk about uh, uh, the possibility to uh, use the stability pact mechanism, uh, uh, the Italians say, well, but what happens if then the Europeans come here as they did with Greece and impose uh, certain reforms and measures? So uh, uh, there is a legacy of that crisis and the legacy is uh, uh, that uh, the weaker countries, the countries that are more in difficulty then can be seen their own uh, uh, according to the sovereignist uh, um, sovereignty uh, squeezed uh, reduced uh, because of the control from the outside that's a narrative that goes on a, a lot into the public debate uh, so the solidarity within the european union was uh, uh, shown to be weak uh, during the economic crisis the great credibility with respect to uh, a support from the outside has uh, been reduced by the experience of the crisis. And the economic crisis has also led to two important phenomena. One is the Euro skepticism, and particularly in a populist form. We know that populism is not something that uh, is part of Europe only, it's uh, spreading in several other parts of the world. But in Europe, uh, it's uh, joined with uh, Europe's skepticism. And um, 
um, Brexit is um, um, largely explicable uh, also on the basis of the uh, heaviness of the economic crisis, uh, on the basis of the effects of this economic crisis on already existent inequalities and the inability of the European countries and the European Union to cope with the inequalities uh, created by a global economy that has also brought very good uh, results, but it also has brought uh, within countries inequality. So these things have weakened the European uh, uh, project. They have uh, enhanced uh, uh, Europe's skepticism where in countries where there was uh, virtually known, Italy is one of those, Italy was one of the largest supporters in terms of public opinion of Europe and European integration. And now the percentage of uh, Euro supporters is squeezed incredibly. Now the second crisis uh, was the migrants crisis or the so-called migrants crisis, what it was depicted and described uh, as a crisis for Europe, um, more not only the refugees, so the people that arrived from countries in war, like uh, the, the pressure from Syria from 2015 onwards, 14, 15 onwards, uh, but also the pressure from uh, the South and Mediterranean route, and so from uh, Libya in particular. Uh, now, 2015 and 2016 have been really, really years in which in European countries, particularly in the countries of the periphery, uh, Italy, Greece, but also Hungary, uh, uh, the main uh, argument, the main topic uh, of debate in newspapers was migration. Mm -hmm. And this was, uh, uh, has been feeding a lot uh, uh, populism and sovereignism. So the the left, uh, the right wing uh, um, version of populism. Uh, in Italy, we had a government with Lega Nord uh, that has these characteristics. It, it also, in different moments, has supported the possible withdrawal of the European of Italy from the European Union. So this was a situation that we already experienced uh, in very recent years. Hmm? Uh, now we have another government. Uh, this government is much more supportive of European integration, but uh, the slow path of the reaction and support by other European countries and the European Union in the beginning of the Corona crisis uh, has built up uh, on uh, Europe's skepticism. Mm -hmm. So um, the government needs to do a lot of uh, work into communicating Europe in another way, uh, showing the relevance of the, this uh, new agreement uh, um, of proposal better uh, that I will show in a moment. Uh, but the situation is not an easy one. I mean, a large part of the public and uh, uh, political forces are very skeptical. Now, in the case of other European countries, also the situation is not easy. The fact that uh, uh, Germany has been less affected in terms of deaths, because yeah. the health system of Germany was definitely much more prepared and equipped. Uh, the, uh, the structures that they have was not comparable with the one in Italy. It was a slow reaction of solidarity, but then eventually it occurred. So they accepted uh, sick people from Italy to go to Germany. Uh, mm. So much more support arrived. Uh, so, but the fact that uh, Germany was much better off in health, uh, in terms of health uh, responses, uh, doesn't make Germany out of any problem at all. Not only because uh, the for economic forecast calculates that also Germany will be affected, but yes. also, and more than this, uh, politically, because uh, uh, this, as any other crisis, uh, is uh, already um, used by uh, uh, populist movements, uh, uh, extreme right movements uh, uh, for their own purposes. So um, recently in the past weeks, it has appeared frequently in the newspapers, evidence of the fact that there has been 
important infiltrations uh, into the manifestations against the lockdown in uh, Berlin and in several other Stuttgart um, infiltrations from the extreme right. Mm. So uh, the movements uh, and the street gatherings uh, were apparently against the lockdown as a violation of the people freedom but in reality, they have been uh, very much manipulated by extreme right movements. Now, Germany is one country, but it's very diversified internally between East and West. Mm -hmm. And uh, Eastern Germany and the uh, less uh, better off, let's say, or worse off areas of the countries that are particularly in the East uh, are more subject to be influenced by the extreme right. And the extreme right is disruptive for the current government and the government that Angela Merkel would like to see in the future, but it's also disruptive of the uh, Germany's role into the European Union and the European Union itself. So it's not so strange that Germany undertook this uh, step. She is uh, probably um, the real politician that we have in Europe, <laughs> if I may say. Yeah. And uh, she is uh, also very, very much aware that German economy depends quite a lot on the possibility to export to other European countries. Right. And that uh, the other European countries' economy is uh, very relevant for the economy of Germany. If the European integration collapses, uh, it would be a severe danger for the economy of Germany also, not only of Italy. So the interdependence. The interdependence. It's a high interdependence. The single market is a fundamental achievement and it's uh, worth a lot of money for all European countries. And I think uh, this will become visible in a few years also to um, Great Britain. Sonia, there's one more thought in my mind, and you are the Europeanist, so you probably will um, uh, echo what I'm saying. The exit of the UK, you know, um, now it's no longer part of the decision-making uh, processes. In what way has Britain's, um, um, you know, uh, um, removal from the picture um, made things easier or worse now? I mean, in terms of the recovery fund, I mean, probably, you know, in terms of the size, uh, Germany, France, and then it will have to be the UK, had it been there in the EU, these were the three biggest economies. So um, would, if the UK, let us say, had not break, had Brexit not happened, was it um, going to be harder to achieve this or easier? Because, you know, this populist push uh, that you just spoke about is not only in the continent, but especially in the UK, where they would say, why should we pay to bail out um, Italy or, 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 or Spain, you know? Uh, so we have to manage our own, and the UK itself has been badly affected by coronavirus. So that factor, you know, post-Brexit, uh, what do you think? Is it uh, making things easier to come up with a unified front or, or harder? I mean, this is a debate that has been going on since uh, the, uh, the referendum in 2016, and then particularly since the withdrawal of uh, the United Kingdom in January this year. Um, it's difficult to respond also because the current program, uh, on which I, I can spend a few words now, the current program is uh, devoted particularly for the countries that have been the most affected by the coronavirus. And currently, the United Kingdom is one of those. <clears throat> so, in fact, is uh, considering Europe uh, without Russia is the most hit. So uh, if uh, the United Kingdom was within the European Union still, um, it would have profited of this, uh, of this fi finance and not uh, being a net contributor on also only. Then the second thing is that, uh, sorry, contrary to the, um, to the previous packages, this package uh, is uh, supposed to be financed uh, through bonds that will be, uh, through money that will be collected on the market. So it will be no additional money uh, from the pockets of the member states or from the pockets of the Europeans directly. 
but it will come out of uh, bonds that will be issued, so these recovery bonds, uh, long term, so from eight years to 30 six if i'm not wrong 38 years so a long um, a long time uh, gathered uh, from the european union from the markets and guaranteed by the european union uh, uh, budget so this is the issue at stake uh, the countries that are opposing this is say why should we guarantee for that so so why we should we guarantee with our own budget uh, the debt uh, of others hmm? mm. Uh, but that's also the most important step ahead of this program. Uh, now, um, there is also a restructuring of the ordinary budget in order to cope with the uh, coronavirus. So there is also a debate on how to use this budget and whether uh, to use it in terms of grants and not only loans. And the the countries that um, are opposing this, uh, so what we call in Italian, it's can, uh, paesi frugali. Uh, yeah, with, frugal four, frugal four in English, yeah. So the frugal countries uh, are against this, that they say, well, we can, uh, we can uh, lo uh, give loans, uh, so borrow money, but we don't give grants so why should we simply give up money to the countries and then share the risk uh the um the key words here is uh, solidarity in fact mm -hmm. and uh, it's the idea that uh, the most hit countries uh, should be supported more than others uh, and that the money for that uh, would be uh, collected out of new measures uh, to collect money, out of new ways to collect money. So the, the program is very innovative. It, mm -hmm. To be honest, already in the first weeks of the crisis, uh, there, some very innovative steps were taken. Uh, for instance, there was uh, uh, by the, in, within three weeks or so uh, from the beginning of the crisis, there was a suspension of the stability pact which was something that was unthinkable before. And then the European Central Bank started to buy bonds on national markets to help the countries in greater difficulties very fastly. I mean, after a first moment in which it seemed that it would not, and this created a lot of criticism, but mm -hmm. then it started to buy bonds. Then, then another package was adopted in April worth uh, uh, 540,000 billion euros uh, um, with a program for temporary layoffs uh, of the European Union. The program is called the SURE. Um, and then a very important step also that seemed to be unthinkable, the European stability mechanism uh, that was already in place has been revised in order to be given without conditions in the case of expenses, direct or indirect, to cope with the coronavirus emergency. So this is really a big package. It was already a very steep step, important step ahead. And these measures are to be implemented now. So uh, time is uh, ready for this. Uh, also the loans of the investment bank to enterprises is uh, worth 200, um, 250 um, billion euros is, uh, um, is in place. Um, what has been discussed uh, and agreed upon by Merkel and uh, Macron and then endorsed into the proposal that the European Commission issued on 27 May, so a very recent one, is this recovery plan for Europe um, that has been uh, widened. The recovery and resilience plan altogether is worth uh, 1,850 billion euros. And of this, uh, 1,100 billion is in the revised budget. But the most innovative thing is the 550 billion next generation Europe uh, uh, program that you mentioned. Now, uh, this next generation program is worth 500 billion grants, so given to the countries and 250 um, oh. loans. 
Um, so the proportion is much more in favor of grants. The instruments are very important and innovative. The instrument for recovery and resilience uh, that will distribute grants and loans on the basis of uh, plans and programs that uh, the countries put in place. So they propose these uh, programs. New structure of funds, uh, strengthening horizon 2020. So it's really uh, important. Now, one concern that we had, Europeans observers, was that uh, in all this uh, effort to relaunch the economy, uh, reopen uh, whatever it takes, uh, we would forget about the Green New Deal. Uh, you know that the, this commission opened with a big program for a new, a new green... Climate, climate change, yeah, to combat climate change. New green economy from climate change to local uh, environmental impact. Uh, and uh, I'm very glad to say that uh, the president of the commission has just relaunched this program. So the fact that you invest money and you keep it, you keep it more than an eye, but a lot of attention in making a different type of economy. So even rethinking the way in which we participate into globalization. Um, so yeah, those are- sounds, sounds uh, progressive and hopeful uh, for the future. So definitely, I think the depth of the crisis and the interdependence have forced, you know, some rather uh, you know bold and innovative, like as you said, measures. Now moving on, uh, Sonia, we have five minutes before we open up for questions. Um, you know, you are a scholar of EU foreign policy. Now the EU as an actor, uh, it's got a new uh, you know executive um, offices, new president, um, a new. Um, high representative for foreign affairs and all these things uh, recently. Now the question really going forward now is uh, the EU's role uh, as a player. You know, Macron especially has been pushing for uh, Europe as independent from the US. You know, that's an old French, uh, you know, uh, uh, since the Charles de Gaulle, they've been talking about this, but now it looks, I mean, the US, look at the US response. I mean, first of all, Trump will not give a single dollar for any European reconstruction or rebuilding. And two, he needs everything to rebuild America itself. So there is no, you know, um, those who know your history um, in the audience, uh, people, you remember there was a Marshall Plan, you know, after World War II, United States coming in and, you know, pumping money to revive Western Europe, to counter communism and uh, build the prosperity that we see today, the basis of it was with the US support. Now all that is gone. I mean, that's just totally out of the picture and uh, Trump uh, has withdrawn from the transatlantic cooperation and all those things. So, uh, and on the other hand, the other big player in the world, uh, Sonia, is China. And the virus originated in China and many people are angry about it around the world. And the EU uh, also supported the recent uh, resolution in the World Health uh, Organization for uh, an impartial inquiry into the origins uh, of the virus uh, and the pandemic. Um, and of course, there is economic interdependence on both sides. The U EU needs the US and also China. Uh, but um, this is really the question, you know, on the minds of many of us observing from the outside. Is this the crisis where as Merkel has been saying, as Macron has been for a long time, that you know we Europeans we have to be self-reliant. We cannot depend or even count on any big outside player to uh, uh, enable us. So, is this that kind of a moment? You think the crisis is so deep now, this depression that and it and there are no precedents to this because in the past there was always this transatlantic, you know, solidarity, and now. Um, now, even Britain is out of the picture for the rest of the EU. So is this the kind of moment where if you take the bigger picture of the world, the EU is on its own now, you know? And um, is that a kind of a cathartic moment where you would suddenly realize that um, we have to rebuild on our own now after Corona? And uh, this is the, and the recovery fund you mentioned, all these seem to be going in the direction that um, the, the era when the EU would play a junior partner or be attached to some other bigger power center is over now. So how do you see that process going forward? I mean, 
uh, there are many dimensions to this, but Europe as one uh, power center in the world uh, in foreign affairs, is that coming, is that going to happen now as a result of this extraordinary crisis? Um, it is uh, definitely difficult to tell now because there are too many question marks uh, and it's uh, difficult in itself. So let me start with the question marks. First of all, um, the one made by the commission is a proposal. It needs to be approved by with the unanimity of the member states. This implies that some compromises will have to be made and it will depend on uh, how many compromises, which compromises, uh, uh, and uh, only on the basis of this, uh, we will see what comes at the end. That's the first thing. The second thing is that this uh, imposes time and uh, we don't have much time. The economy is uh, losing quite a lot. The uh, economic forecast for Italy is dramatic. Um, uh, we, have, we, we have different figures that go the most extreme minus 13% uh, of GDP, the most likely minus 10% of GDP. The entire European economy is losing uh, roughly 7%. Uh, so we are really uh, losing a lot. Mm. Um, and this implies that uh, it affects people and uh, it affects job. The job market is going to squeeze again uh, and a lot. And we know that these circumstances are the circumstances in which it is much easier for anti-European and even anti-democratic forces to emerge. So this uh, trends, uh, anti-European and anti-democratic trends uh, are in place already. Uh, and uh, they are, and they would be really very, very dangerous for the European project and for us as European citizens. And if this happens, so if time is not sufficient, if the measures are not sufficient, uh, there is no way that the European Union can play any role in the world. It has just to save itself. Uh, so that's a big uh, question mark. It's not a question that pertains with the uh, absence of the United States. It's an internal issue of Europe. Europe is uh, perfectly, would be perfectly self-sustainable if it was more united and uh, supportive of each other. Uh, so we better do not create uh, um, too high expectations of what can come because there are too many question marks, uh, time and agreement among states uh, being the most relevant to, my, to me. Um, the second observation is that uh, uh, if things go well and if the European Union package is, going, is arriving in time and uh, the emergency, I mean, the, the impact of the economic crisis will be there because that's unavoidable but reduced. Uh, then Europe has the chance to continue playing a role worldwide. The fact that you mentioned before uh, that uh, the United Kingdom is not part of the company anymore might even help uh, into making some uh, further steps uh, ahead, but in terms of structures, so for instance, we, you know that we launched uh, in 2016 with the global strategy. Uh, we immediately afterwards launched uh, the PESCO program, which is an enhanced cooperation into the defense sector. That is basically an industrial cooperation among the different defense industries in Europe. And that depends on money and investments. And one of the fear is that this is going to be slowed down quite a lot uh, in the face of the current crisis. Um, however, this is not to me the most important issue because uh, this, uh, again, would only create more cooperation among the industries, but not necessarily more cooperation on, on the minds that will use <laughs> these instruments. Uh, the, the biggest problem is the fact that Europe is uh, once again very much concentrated on its own survival and recovery. 
-hmm. And when Europe, uh, as it has happened various times in the past, uh, is so concentrated on itself as a process more than an actor, then uh, actorness uh, uh, suffers. The ability mm -hmm. to stay together in the world uh, and talk as one in the world is very much reduced by the fact that we are fighting inside. And that's uh, really a pity because Europe in economic terms, uh, cultural terms, in many respects would really have the, uh, the ability to play uh, quite an important role into the redefinition of global governance, which we desperately need. Yeah. I would not say that multilateralism is completely dead um, to the extent to which we can consider uh, regional integration and cooperation as part of a broader puzzle of, of global multilateral cooperation. So multilateralism is uh, a variable geometry uh, structure. You can have multilateral settings uh, at the regional level and at the global level. The important thing is that the, the entire machine works. And so uh, working on the World Health Organization, reforming it uh, and strengthening it, uh, making it dialogue better with the regional cooperation in the health sector. These are all directions that need to be taken. And uh, in my view, uh, the European Union is the actor that could play the most important role because it has its own internal experience of multilateralism. So it knows perfectly how difficult yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, uh, Sonia, just uh, on the China question, you know, in India, especially we are all um, concerned about China because it's right next door and it's become a great power today. Um, the Europeans, uh, from what I have um, ascertained in the last uh, few months, while Trump is on a kind of like a war path and he's demanding, uh, you know, answers from China and wants more and more pressure on China for uh, causing the pandemic, the Europeans have told a kind of like a softer line. And the real question going forward for EU as a bloc, I mean, not individual countries, but uh, EU as a bloc really is... Um, are the, I mean, the, the, the prediction is that we are now in some so-called new Cold War between China and the US. And, you know, the last time there was a Cold War, Europe was caught in between, you know, and divided badly between the Soviet Union and the US. So in that sense, uh, probably, and while I don't think the parallel is correct, because today China and the US still have interdependence, they're not fully decoupled, but the decoupling is happening as we are talking. So um, do you foresee trouble for the EU in this role? It's not only the internal weaknesses you mentioned, but the, even the global um, configuration it seems to be such that um, there will be some uh, EU countries, particularly these Eastern, uh, Central and Eastern European ones that may gravitate uh, closer to China, it seems, uh, because of the aid and the other uh, assistance that they're giving. And while the Western ones will try to forge a separate, you know, uh, value-based, you know, uh, identity, foreign policy identity of democracy and human rights and constitutionalism. So is the EU really, I mean, I know they have a dialogue process with China, just as they have with the US and all that. But what is your take? I mean, this crisis, is the EU going to be more uh, forthright or actually become more cautious with China? Oh, so first thing, um, uh, a new Cold War is not uh, um, unavoidable. Uh, the new, new Cold War is not uh, an objective result that has no other <laughs> strategy. Um, I mean, I don't want to sound too constructivist, but we construct it. Uh, um, I mean, the, the, the fact that China is rising in several respects does not unavoidably link uh, China to uh, collide with the United States. Um, I don't believe in the Thucydides trap. And I think that uh, uh, Donald Trump is, has a personal interest in building it in building the momentum for this. Um, uh, Donald Trump at the moment has to uh, fight for uh, the, uh, new, the renewal of the presidency. 
he has some internal difficulties, although not having a stronger counterpart uh, in terms of candidates. But still, uh, uh, there are uncertainties for him. And he's doing uh, everything that he can to detract attention for his own internal responsibilities for what is happening uh, in the United States uh, uh, in relation to the corona crisis. And uh, is, um, as is very frequent uh, in, in politics, particular in his politics, uh, he's attacking China. Um, I don't think this is the moment to uh, blame uh, anyone uh, as particularly responsible. Um, it's not this moment. Uh, it's something that we can do and we will uh, do. I think diplomacy will have to work on this. Uh, um, uh, studies have been to, to be made on, on the specific responsibilities of late uh, communication and so on, but um, this is not the moment and this is not the best way to cope with the emergency we have before. What we need to do is to work uh, as much as possible together to um, uh, achieve a governance of health which is uh, uh, efficient because the, there are only losers here and no winners if we don't do that. A very, a very European answer, uh, Sonia. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, I think we do need cooperation. Uh, but we are running out of time now. So I'll take some questions and Sonia, maybe you can answer. There is a question from uh, a person in the audience called Abhijit and he's, he says, um, how do you see Yanis Varoufakis, you know, the Greek, the former Greek uh, finance minister, the leftist, his um, uh, suggestion that Europe should go for universal basic income to revive the economy of all members and that it should move beyond capitalism and that this is the moment because the capitalist model failed, you know, with, with Corona and the have nots, the people were left behind, the elderly died, the poor died. And clearly, you know, who lives and who dies, it was a very stark choice, this crisis. So radical, the left is saying that, you know, capitalism itself has failed. Is the European, is, can we think of an alternative? That's the question, you know, or is it going to carry on as usual with some minor adjustments? I think that what we learned from this crisis is uh, that uh, um, the countries that have coped with this the best are those uh, in which we have a strong welfare state, strong for what has remained of the welfare state. So for instance, in the case of Italy, I'm very proud to say that despite the tragedy of the many people uh, that have died and have been affected, they have not hit more certain people rather than others, classes, race, uh, or whatever. So they are in fact people regardless of race, regardless of class, regardless of origin, have been all cured in the same way and they have been affected in the same way. And this is only because this is a country in which there is a, a sufficient attention to uh, equality, despite the fact that there are inequalities. Mm -hmm. But most of all, there is a welfare state system that uh, is uh, um, taking care of everybody, of any, not only citizens, but even tourists. Huh? The first uh, sick people here were two Chinese that were visiting Rome. And we had reports on their health uh, every day on TV. Hmm? Hmm. So, uh, so you're saying the social democracy, social democratic form of absolutely. capitalism can in, handle it. Uh, in the United Kingdom, which is the country that traditionally has the Gini factor, which is the highest of Europe and, and one very high for Western countries. Yeah. The Gini factor is the inequality uh, indicator. Uh, this is not happening. Uh, people, uh, the Guardian reports uh, rather regularly how um, people in different social economic conditions are affected in different ways. In the United States, the black community is much more affected and dies much more of coronavirus yeah. rather than the whites. And this is not something that I like. And it, the, to blame is not capitalism. We don't have an alternative to capitalism. To blame 
is the way in which we do it. Huh? Mm. Capitalism so is talking the about the two variants, the laissez-faire model of the US and the UK versus the continental the social democratic. So great. Yeah. Now we are almost out of time. But yeah. uh, Sonia, uh, last question. If you're an average person, uh, you know, recovering in this great depression in Europe, in different corners, are you going to think much about Brussels and the EU at all? Or is your focus, uh, is your reference point now going to be almost entirely on me, my government? What is my regional or national government doing for me? Can I uh, trust these people or not? Or what I'm trying to ask you is, is this crisis going to remake the identity of average people, ordinary people and um, make them more alienated or closer to the idea of a United States of Europe or of a Europe as a whole? You know, uh, Are they going to go back to national identity or still think in terms of the, um, you know, the, the continent as a whole? You know, that's the, we, maybe if you can give a brief uh, answer to that, please. Yes. Um, uh, we... For definitely the coronavirus has brought countries to be concerned for themselves a lot. So there has been a first phase in which there has been a rally around the flag around the governments in each individual country. Uh, there has been a relaunch of proudness, we Italians, we French, etc, etc. Uh, but most European countries, I can't tell for everybody because I mean, I, can't, I don't read the newspapers of all European countries, but what I can tell you from the newspapers of the countries of which I read the, new, the, the newspapers themselves is that uh, uh, there is a, a daily uh, uh, reference to the European Union. No country really think to be able to cope with this alone. Mm. And, uh, these rec and this has been made very clear. Uh, by Angela Merkel and Macron. And uh, the program is one in which it is uh, perfectly clear that uh, either we do it together and we get out of this together or we don't get out at all. That's, and, so uh, unity, unity will matter. Uh, we are almost out of time, uh, yes. Sonia, but last point um, is the whole question of the, uh, you know, the EU's future, you know, so there was a time people were saying uh, it's in, it's going to balkanize, there are going to be more and more exits, but I feel, and from this discussion, that I think the you, going forward, like you said, see, alone, none of these countries can really cope with this depression. So it seems like from an integration point of view, despite all the pain and the suffering and the losses of coronavirus, that we can look up to the future. So are you optimistic? I'm moderately optimistic. This is one of those turning points. Uh, and uh, to, as any turning point, you can go one direction or another. Um, I have written a book last summer that was very pessimist, which I'm usually not a person like. Uh, was very pessimist because uh, the presence of uh, populism, uh, the Lim limited uh, democracy in some countries. The, uh, I mean, it's uh, the hate speeches that are rising and we're all very bad indicators in terms of state of society and politics. Uh, now this is really a turning point and uh, the result uh, depends uh, on luck, what the, pa the pandemics will be in autumn and on uh, political responses. It will also depend on the ability of the Europeans to get informed on what Europe and the European Union mean and has done uh, beyond uh, the uh, discourse of populism that has monopolized the public debate in several European countries in the past years. Right. So maybe this is a turning point, uh, just as it is a turning point for the world, uh, surely for Europe, which is a crucible for integration. Let's hope for the best. Uh, thank you, Professor Sonia Lucarelli. It's been such a you know intellectually stimulating conversation. Um, I'm sure it will be watched uh, and discussed widely. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you to the audience, and uh, we are going to continue the dialogue series. But keep thinking about the big problems and keep an eye on Europe because, as I said, it was the leader in terms of uh, unification uh, of a region of a whole region. And uh, how it responds in a unified fashion remains to be, is going to be watched widely 
world over. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very much. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.